Here's an overall vector called f, making an angle of theta. Please break this vector into components. You would start by writing down your axes, and the axes are also representing the positive directions. Now, we know that normally we choose a horizontal and a vertical axis. On most problems, we would have a horizontal and a vertical axis. And in those cases, we would, wouldn't really hardly even need to break this into components because it would be obvious that it was completely horizontal. It only has a horizontal component, no vertical component. However, there are a fair number of problems where you use a non-horizontal and non-vertical axis. And that's what we're doing here. We have non-horizontal and non-vertical axes. Um, so now it really isn't ob uh, obvious how long the components are. Um, so we do have to break this vector into components. Uh, perhaps I should mention that the material we're going over here is certainly, uh, this is not highly advanced material. This is not something that you're unlikely to see. You're definitely going to have to do problems in your physics course with non-horizontal and non-vertical axes. It's completely standard to have to use non-horizontal and non-vertical axes. This is, this is pretty sure to come up in your physics course and also on a test like the MCAT if that's what you're preparing for. So this is important material to learn. To break this into components, we have to draw the right triangle that uses this overall vector as the hypotenuse. We want the legs to be parallel to the axes. The key is to draw legs parallel to the axes. Well, we should assume that this dashed reference line is parallel to the x-axis. Otherwise, we can't solve the problem. So let's assume that this dashed reference line is parallel to the x-axis. Then one of the legs would be along the dashed reference line. So I'm just going to draw the leg in along this dashed line. I'm going to draw it pretty long and then I'll shorten it as need be. Now I have to draw another leg parallel to the y-axis, keeping in mind that if I'm drawing it correctly, it should end up perpendicular to the first leg. Now I can shorten this. Here's f sub x parallel to the x-axis. Here's f sub y parallel to the y-axis. We can't go on until we put the arrows on the components, showing the directions of the components. Well, as a trick, we could imagine that the overall vector is pointing away from this initial point and towards this final point. Therefore, one of the components should be pointing away from the initial point, and the other component should be pointing towards the final point. Uh, again, that terminology of initial and final is not something that your instructor would use for this type of problem. I just think it, it's maybe a useful trick for getting the arrows right on the components. Notice that you have to be kind of careful on these problems that your arrowheads don't get all confused with each other. Because you're always going to have the arrowhead on one of the components pointing to the same place that the arrowhead on the overall vector is. So try to draw nice, thin arrowheads so that the arrowhead on this component doesn't get all confused with the arrowhead on the overall vector. Neatness counts. I probably should already have indicated that this was the information that we were originally given and that this was the information that we're trying to figure out. If you're asked to break something into components, that's the same as asking you for the x and y components. The asterisk helps us to figure out which side is adjacent and which side is, hypo uh, is opposite. We use the cosine to find the adjacent side. Remember that if you ever have any doubts about this equation, you can go back to the more basic equation. Cosine equals adjacent divided by hypotenuse. Cosine equals adjacent divided by hypotenuse. And if you cross multiply, you'll get this equation. The length of the adjacent side is represented by the magnitude of f sub x, indicated with a dot. The hypotenuse is f. That's as much as we can figure out here about the magnitude of the x component, but we're not done until we find the sine component. When someone asks you to break something into components, they mean break it into sine components. Because it's the sine components that we're going to be using to solve problems. Focusing on the x component, this x component was pointing down and to the right, and the positive x axis is also pointing down and to the right. So the x component was in the positive direction. And we've decided that we're going to indicate positive, uh, positives with positive signs, just like we indicate negatives with negative signs.
the length of the opposite side is the magnitude of f sub y, indicated with a dot. The hypotenuse has a length of f. You can use a dot or not use a dot for the overall vector, uh, because there is no such thing as a signed overall vector. So it doesn't matter whether you're so careful to distinguish between uh, the dot or not. Now we know the magnitude of f sub y. It's time to figure out the signed f sub y component. According to the arrow that we figured out, f sub y is pointing up and to the right. And the positive y direction is up and to the right. So f sub y is positive. Remember that the convention on a problem with no numbers is that your answers should just include the original variables that you were given. Well, the original variables we were given were f and theta. So our answers can only include f and theta. Well, this answer only includes f and theta, and this answer only includes f and theta. You can't include unknowns. So for example, you can't define f sub x in terms of f sub y. I can't have an f sub y over here because f sub y is an unknown. Uh, but fortunately, we didn't do that. We're just using the given variables uh, to figure out f sub x. Similarly, you can't figure out f sub y in terms of f sub x. You can't have an f sub x on the right-hand side here because f sub x was an unknown. You have to use just the given variables f and theta. Well, we've done that.